Hello? Hello? Oh, hi, Kim. Hi there. I don't, I don't see you. <laughs> Is your camera on? Oh, no, not yet. Sorry, give me oh, a okay, okay. second. How are you doing? Good, good. That's good. Um, yeah, might as well be. Maybe I'll just be on mute just so that. Okay. We yeah. wait for the host to come in. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'll Hi, Kim. Yeah. 
So um, Paul is just having a little bit of audio issues on his end. So oh. he's asked us to, um, he's made both of us co-hosts. Okay. Um, and he's asked us to like start uh, without him if he can get his audio connected. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, I, I just told him that the, um, we'll start sharp at one. Okay. So that's the time given to everybody else. <laughs> um, and uh, for our slides, since we're co-hosts, we should be um, able to switch the slides. Um, or if you want me to um, say like, welcome Kim and hand you over to start. What I can do is that just so that you don't necessarily have to keep moving the screen, as soon as you're done with uh, a slide, just um, say next slide and I'll jump to the next slide. Okay, so there's just, you're just, we're just gonna put up the one PowerPoint then, that's good. Yes, just so that sure. because on their end, they have um, a little bit of issue, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to. <laughs> yes, yes, that keep, you'll keep it simple. That's perfect. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just want to keep it simple, just so that you know, um, it's it's all a little um, seamless. So as soon as you say next slide, I'll I'll move on to the next slide, and um, yeah, I I think that that should be perfect. Um, good, and after um, those, I'll I'll come back to the, I'll say thank you and go to the takeaway slide and then um, finish off and whatever time's remaining is the Q&A, so. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good. Yes, and I think he, okay, so Paul said that maybe 102, like two minutes after one. Okay, to start, okay. Yeah. Give people a, a minute or two to get back from lunch, I guess. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. I, yeah. Again, um, Kim, like I know you are super, super busy. I truly, truly appreciate you like complimenting um, my slides because it it is just it adds so much, so much more depth <laughs> to what we want to talk about. So. so. Yeah. yeah no, Hi there. Hi, Paul. It's Paul. Yeah, Hi, Paul. I've called in on the phone. Sorry, guys. Oh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, so the browser worked great yesterday, but now the browser tells me that it needs to be updated. So I've jumped on uh, my phone so that sure. um, I'll just um, get the visual going here. How are Hi you? Hey. Good, thanks. Technology, isn't it great? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I will use um, the phone to introduce you and to um, provide a visual. Uh, um, and then I'll use my computer to provide the admin function and allow people that are in the waiting room okay. to come into the meeting. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. So Kim, you have an easy name to pronounce. <laughs> So it's the Kim last, Bold the last Bolger? name. Yeah. Yeah. Bol Bolger. Bolger. Yeah. Bolger. Okay. okay. Uh, Bolger. Yeah. It kind of sounds like the G sounds like a J. Bolger. Yeah. Yeah. Bolger. Um, and your name is uh, Ilya? Ilya. 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 Ilya Dewan. Correct. Dewan. Yes. Ilya. Yes. Okay. Yes. I won't say very much. I'll introduce you and welcome people into the session. I'll start doing that now. And then I will, you've got the co-host function set up so you can share your screen um, and go from there. And then at the end, I'll keep an eye on the chat and see if there's any uh, written questions. Uh, we'll go through those first. And then if there's any audio questions at the end of that, uh, we'll follow up on that as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'll just start admitting. We had 34 registered. Uh, this morning. Uh, remains to be seen how many actually come. That's always kind of a, uh, an interesting game of uh, 
prediction. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Um, okay, I'm going to start admitting. Welcome everyone. I'm just starting to admit uh, people from the waiting room. Um, so please be patient. Um, my name is Paul Macedo. I'm with CanDo. I'm the communications officer. And this session today is uh, partnerships and solutions for indigenous health system strengthening, um, a Kesso perspective. Um, so I know it's, um, it's right on the hour, but we've got uh, some folks still joining us. So we'll probably give it another minute or so, and then I'll introduce you to our speakers. So this is part of our regular Can Do um, Webinar Wednesday, where we provide um, opportunities for EDOs and uh, people in the community to enhance their skills, um, learn about some new initiatives, or uh, maybe about some, um, some projects that they might want to get involved with that they didn't know very much about. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Paul Macedo with Can Do. I'm the communications officer. And today's free Wednesday webinar is Partnerships and Solutions for Indigenous Health System Strengthening, a Kesso Perspective. Today uh, presenting would be Kim Bulger, a Kesso advisor, and Elia Dewan, Kesso Project Officer. They will uh, speak with you regarding uh, the, this initiative by Kesso. And I will uh, turn off my microphone and let the smart people start talking any second now. So I'm just going to admit the last folks in the waiting room. And I'm not sure who's going first, Kim, Ilya? Myself. Not Ilya's gonna start. Yeah. Very good, okay. I'll uh, mute myself now, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to can do and for Paul for working with us to hosting this webinar today. Um, I will start sharing my screen just so that we can all get started. And this one's almost there. So Okay, hi everyone. Before we start, I wanted to share a story with you. Several years ago, Kesso was in Pangerton, a remote and beautiful hamlet in Nunavut, whose mountains are thought to be so beautiful that they are sometimes referred to as the Switzerland of the Arctic. The community is a tight knit one. They are deep, um, they have deep culture and they are rich with their vibrant fishing hub. But something was troubling the community. They saw that their people were suffering from trauma and hardship. So, what did the community do? Well, they banded together, came together with their leaders, revived their healing groups, created a suicide prevention action plan, and hosted several workshops to support people suffering from trauma. This was helpful for the community to support its people in its journey and everyday to day life for overall well-being. This story and situation is summed up beautifully by Marcus, who was then counselor at Pangerton. He said that economic development, or you cannot do economic development without strength building and addressing health and social services and issues in the community. He also said that you cannot have a population that 
needs to be strong and capable to hold jobs. With this, I want to start by giving you a brief introduction to myself. My name is Ilya Diwan, and I'm Project Officer at Keso Indigenous Services, working on program development and management. I'm speaking today from the traditional Indigenous territories of the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I would like to honor, thank, and you know, pay my respects to the land where we live and work. Keso believes that addressing inequality and helping people have better access to wellness services creates an environment where Indigenous peoples can participate in fully and benefit from economic growth. So welcome you all to our per, uh, presentation today on partnerships and solutions for Indigenous health systems from our perspective. A brief look at our organization. So Keso is a not-for-profit organization, uh, but before that, here's a brief outline of what else we'll be talking about. So there is a brief intro to our organization. Like I said, I'll be talking about a few examples of collaborations that we did with several indigenous communities to strengthen their health systems. And then my colleague will come in to take you to a much deep, deeper look into the different solutions that communities have led in order to work on their health systems objectives. So a quick look into our organization. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization working in Canada and internationally for over 50 years now. And we aim to contribute to a sustainable economy. And we do this by partnering and strengthening institutions and businesses. We deploy our experts to communities from coast to coast to coast in Canada. And our experts volunteer their time and energy through over 500 projects every year. Our advisors are highly experienced executives and they have diverse skills and diverse experiences that help them to support communities in areas such as finance, HR, board mentoring, strategic planning, et cetera. Our advisors are culturally sensitive and they're provided training and support before projects, as well as throughout projects as they do them. Because we are a low cost alternative to many other advisors used by communities, we can provide affordable and accessible solutions to different communities who we can work with. So now that you know a little bit about our organization, these are some of the areas that we've worked with in Indigenous health. So over the past 50 years, we've uh, partnered with Indigenous governments, health departments, wellness centers, businesses, and community organizations to strengthen their health systems. These are some of the areas that we've supported in, including HR policies and review, developing organizational policies, um, working on mentoring their executives, as well as various other business planning and development support. If we just look at the past 15 years, we've completed more than a hundred health sector related projects. Now I want to take you to a few collaborations and examples of collaborations that we've done with different communities, starting with BC. So in BC, uh, a First Nation needed support to build a new community health center 
so that they could provide the critical wellness services that they wanted to, to their community. And for that objective, Kesso worked with the First Nation and the management and their leadership to support them through mentoring, training, and workshops so that they strengthen their capacity in health business. So this enabled them to set up a new health center and this new community health center has been operational since January of 2020. So next we go to Yukon where Michelle, Michelle Carmichael, who is pictured here in the slide too, who owns a wellness center in Yukon and she needed support to grow her business so that she could provide her services to more people who wanted access to traditional wellness uh, solutions. Kesso worked with Michelle and mentored her on marketing and business strategies. And this helped her to access new funds, build partnerships, and provide her products and services to more people in the community. So this was very helpful for her as well as the people who had access to her services. Next, we take you to Quebec where the Mohawk Council needed capacity strengthening in providing more accessible health and wellness services to be able to provide to the community. In order to tackle uh, this challenge, our CASO advisors partnered with the Mohawk Council staff and worked with them on creating and launching a five-year strategic plan, which was instrumental for them to create a pathway which they could follow and eventually lead to a long-term community health development. And in Pangerton, Nunavut, the beautiful place that I was talking about earlier, um, these are the photos of the workshops where our Kesso advisors supported the community to facilitate through addressing trauma and violence and the community itself, they were able to do so much more and address their wellness and mental health issues in the community. So these are just two photos of our Kessel advisor speaking, um, as well as the participants in one of the workshops. Next, we take you to Manitoba. And in Manitoba, the Clan Mothers Healing Village is a unique and enterprising health center and a healing lodge. They support women who are suffering from trauma or violence through land-based practices, as well as cultural therapies, solutions, and programs, all of which combined help these women on their journeys. But they had a problem of being able to access more funding and not keep depending on government funding to be able to provide more services to the women that need that. And so they came up with the idea of creating a social enterprise. It is in this endeavor that Kesso partnered with the clan mothers, worked with their leaders and the women to refine their business plan for a social enterprise, which eventually helped them to actually build a solid enterprise that they could support them and have uh, more access to diversified revenue and funding. The Clan Mothers Healing Village, I'm happy to share with everybody, is actually now a leading Indigenous social enterprise in Canada, and they're doing wonderful things. And finally, I take you to Vancouver Island, where the Cowichan Tribal Council 
needed some business planning capacity strengthening to be able to expand their services so that they can provide more of those services to the community in need. They needed some business planning support and that's where CASO partnered with the health center and its staff and leadership, uh, one of whom is pictured here in the slide, uh, Judith, who was the health director. Uh, CASO worked with them to be able to come up with a business plan that worked for them and helped them to expand from a community health center to a regional health center. This was a big milestone for the community. And therefore we also have a success story on the project and its achievements. And it's provided here in the slide uh, for anybody who is willing to take a look at that um, later and want to learn more about the success story. So with that, I have talked to you about our organization, some of the partnerships we've done with different communities to support their health and wellness. For the next part, I would like to welcome Kim. Kim Bulger is a Kessel advisor and she'll be sharing some deep insights from her decades of experience working in governance, uh, management reform, uh, institution strengthening, as well as years of experience working with Kesso itself on a number of projects supporting the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So for now, I welcome Kim. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Ilya. And uh, thank you to Paul for you and for organizing this and coordinating uh, this afternoon. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. As um, Ilya mentioned, uh, I've worked with CASO since about 2013 on uh, diverse projects. And so I thought I would just take some themes and just kind of walk through those um, and just kind of unpack a little bit about what some of the, why um, the different communities reached out to CASO and how we resolve some of their, their concerns. And um, I work both in, in a couple um, assignments were in Nunavut and in First Nations communities. So I wanted to speak about um, strengthening governance. Uh, I worked on with one community, um, identifying and addressing organi organizational barriers and enablers, um, coaching uh, leaders that wanted to um, be promoted within their organization and a, a, st a strategic planning assignment. So um, next slide, please. Ilya. Yeah, and just to kind of reinforce what Ilya had mentioned earlier that the um, the link between health and economic development, like it's an inextricable link. And if, if we need a textbook example, the um, this COVID um, epidemic has reinforced that without healthy communities, there is no economic viability or prosperity. And vice versa, when we have economic prosperity, people's health outcomes are increased as well. So the two work hand in hand. And when we strengthen one, we strengthen the other. So um, with, with um, health reforms coming uh, down, the, down the pipe with, um, you know, and all the attendant uh, challenges like aging population and chronic disease and jurisdictional issues and just reforming health systems and taking control of it. Um, there's many challenges and um, hopefully there, you, you might see a role for Kesso as you um, work down or um, move forward in, in this endeavor. So for the one community, we worked on strengthening uh, governance and the concern that was addressed by the uh, chief and council was that there was a lack of cohesion there, there was a de the community were demoralized and it was kind of manifesting in some of the different um, directorates within the community. And so we interviewed for every um, council member, all the directors, staff. And what was coming up was that there was a, a lack of um, follow through and decision making. Um, 
so the board would make a decision and uh, and in, in small communities, this is sometimes inevitable, but and, and in um, some communities and small rural areas that people are related to each other and know each other. So if somebody would come to the chief and, say, and it was his niece and wanted a decision overturned, like uh, if she was put on a waiting list at the health department, for instance, she would go and talk to her uncle and he would undo the decision. So after doing that a number of years by chief and council and whatever, the community um, began to, there was a, a disrespect for leadership. So we wanted to take the bull by the horns and look at ways to reinforce um, morale, trust, good governance and good leadership. So they talked about, we looked at roles and responsibilities, who's responsible for what, when they make a decision, how, and we, this was discussed over time, you know, the board impact, what does, uh, what, what constitutes good governance, you know, and when the board made a decision, we, we all, they collectively agreed to stick with that decision so that they could begin to show that to the community that we speak with one voice, we're all in this together, we're in unison, we have a common cause to have uh, a good response of um, leadership and address community concerns. So that was that was one, um, one example of, of governance about the board speaking with one voice and uh, clarifying roles and responsibility. The other thing was that um, the board would stick with their domain and let the directors of the different departments have control over that. There would be check-ins so that the staff had some, um, that the board, the board are ultimately accountable for those departments, but that they wouldn't undermine the managers there so that they would stick to their governance structure and the managers would bring um, issues forth, but staff would also have a venue to kind of report to the board. So we developed some of those um, processes so that everybody was kind of sticking to their knitting about what they were supposed to do and not kind of, um, causing unnecessary, and it wasn't, the motive and the intention wasn't bad. They wanted to, to do good and they thought by going in and, and uh, making decisions without the manager's help that they were being, um, that that was being helpful, but it, but it, in the end it wasn't. And they they came to understand that and, and to respect the managers were in those roles and they had their job to do and the board had their job to do. So um, maybe next slide, um, Ilya, please. So another, another assignment entailed looking at um, organizational barriers and enablers. And in, in this case, there had been a very tumultuous uh, con conflict laden um, department. And there had been uh, the conflict hadn't, hadn't been addressed. There was concerns about favoritism and um, it was, thought to be because people re were related to each other and a lot of people weren't, they felt that they weren't being paid fairly and it wasn't transparent. And um, if you were related to the director that you got paid more. And um, so, so there was a whole litany of issues. So again, we, uh, some of this goes back to what good governance about, um, we just talked about identified what the issues were and uh, walk through how to address them. So for HR, it was kind of developing um, a salary grid and and putting it, having it linked to experience and education. And it was posted so that everybody knew that that somebody, any new hires, would be plotted on that salary grid. And it was clear and transparent for all staff. Um, another issue was that uh, training was. Um, recommended to deal with conflict and to deal with conflict at the lowest level before it got um, out of hand, before before it got uh, too far out the barn door, so to speak, so that it was it was dealt with at the in a in a way without um, having to bring in conflict mediators or people quitting or um, taking sick leave or whatever. So it was seen as a cost effective, um, preventative and a protective way to deal with with individuals within the organization. So that was, uh, and I'll speak a bit more to this when we get to another slide about um, collaboration within uh, Kessel.
but if you wanted to move um, to the next slide, uh, Lilia. So this was um, an assignment uh, we worked on in Nunavut and we had a, a mid-level manager who was very, very um, committed to wanting to move up to a, direct, to a directorship. And his concern was he felt his manager, his director wasn't supportive. And in fact, he felt she was sabotaging his, this was his, his perception. I'm not sure if it was, that was how he felt. And um, he felt that his team wasn't kind of cohesive and working towards meeting the goals. So what we did was we, we mapped out a training program for him too. The governor at Nunavut offered a number of training programs. So he identified where his, he felt his skill deficits were, you know, financial and um, dealing with HR issues and um, developing work plans, that type of thing. So we structured out on a calendar, the, the training that he needed so that he would be positioned to be able to take on uh, a directorship when it came up. We also did some role plays and some case studies about how to uh, work with his director. If he, you know, if he felt like he was being left out of the loop, how could he um, directly um, address that in a in a respectful manner? So we did some coaching and role playing and that type of thing. With with his team, we talked about we did some team building and uh, workshops, colors workshops. It was called so everybody's kind of gifts and skills were kind of highlighted in their strengths and also how he could keep people accountable through developing work plans with time frames and you know and that would be a collaborative thing with his staff that it would they were working together to come up with those work plans so that the expectations were clear reasonable um, that there was an accountability between them both and that what what was mapped out for the team helped him to reach his goals and then it would help him to kind of move up the organizational ladder so to speak so that's if you could uh, the next um and uh, people here might be able to appreciate this one uh, this assignment uh dealt with strategic planning and it was an economic development uh, department and their concern was that they were kind of seen as the the dumping ground for all new initiatives and anything that somebody didn't know where to put it, it always went to the economic development uh, department. And they felt like they were drowning in all everything that was coming their way. And that um, they didn't have a sense of where they wanted to go, where they ought to go forward. So what we did, and the other concern they had was that they were operating in silos with the other departments. So we facilitated a strategic um, planning process and we invited, we invited the other um, directors of the health department and all the other departments to participate in that as well as chief and council. And they came up with, um, I think four or five priorities and that enabled them to be able to say no. When things came into their department, they were able to say, no, we've already established these priorities. And the other thing is they developed a table where all the directors would meet on a monthly basis so that they could share and collaborate and each the right hand knew what the left hand was doing. So just having that kind of um, proactive vision instead of being reactive, um, it gave them a sense of they could breathe finally and felt like that they knew where they had to go and what they needed to do and what resources were, requ were required. And by having um, chief and council at the table and the other directors, everybody was aware of what those priorities were. So, um, so that's um, that was a, a strategic planning initiative that we we completed. Um, could you go to the next uh, the next slide, Ilya? Yes. <clears throat> so, just in terms of how Kessel can help. Um, the, the advisors of Kessel, like there's no uh, relationship with communities or no history, no context. So they come in there basically with an unbiased role. And the, uh, the Germans have a word, I think it's, it's pronounced Betreblendheit, uh, and it means operational blindness. So they don't have any of the, um, any of the uh, residual stuff that people within the community might have. So they kind of can come and hit the road running and just, um, 
start from scratch basically when they need to do a, an assessment of a community or a problem or a function. And they are in a position where maybe because they don't have those relationships or they're not, um, uh, they're able maybe to say things to chief and counsel or to a director, or whatever that people within the community or that might be an employee might not be able to say, like it, it, it might be hard for an employee to talk about governance to the chief and counsel or talk about some things to, to management because there could be repercussions. So Kessel can come in there and those are the, the advisors are kind of free to say tactfully and respectfully and diplomatically, but just to say that like for the first one around governance, you know, there's a demoralization in the community and here's how we can help to reinforce through good governance, we can help to upgrade and um, support the uh, increasing the, the morale in this community by doing practicing these um, you know by having transparency and being open and being fair and that type of thing. The other benefit of, of Kesso is um, the multifaceted expertise and I said I would come back to this one but when I was doing um, an organizational review I was able to talk about HR policies and um, you know, people felt discriminated against and whatnot. And we talked about, you know, that it put board in a libelous position through human rights violations, and whatnot. So I was able to kind of outline what the concerns were, but I partnered with another expert at, um, was an expert at Kessel. Uh, she had HR expertise and she developed the pay grids, the salary grids and plotted that all out, which is a very kind of a specialization unto itself. And so we worked together, I kind of did the broad strokes and she had the specific concrete expertise. So, so that's how, you know, when there's, we can partner with even within Kesso and bring that, that um, the needed functions to a community. And just the, the other benefit is uh, the efficiency that we can kind of, kind of jump in, hit the road running and then leave when the, when the specific thing, um, when the specific project is completed. And it enables communities to react uh, or to react quickly to the changes that are needed and, and developments. Um, 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 could I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and I, I think I touched on this. The ability of, of Kessel advisors can um, make difficult recommendations, kind of bring be the the bad cop or bring the bad news, uh, always in a respectful way, but to say say things, but be there in a in a supportive developmental function, not to, it's not in a, in a way to judge or anything, but just here's, here's the gaps or here's the concern and here's what we can do to help to strengthen your community or your system or your department or your um, processes or policies. And then finally, um, you know, Kessel advisors can be a catalyst for change. And I know how it is to, um, these are big ticket items, like if we, you're, taking on health system changes um, to do it amongst your other work. And um, sometimes it helps to have an external person to kind of say, you know, every Wednesday we're going to meet at one o'clock. And it's a lot easier to keep a, a project on track by doing that. And uh, so that kind of helps to mobilize and to facilitate the change process that a community uh, might want. So those are just kind of a quick overview of some of the assignments that I've worked on and um, some of the, I hopefully the benefits that the community was able to um, obtain by reaching out to Kessel. So I'll turn it back over to you, um, Ilya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we really appreciate um, Kim Bolger, who is um, one of our health systems and systems experts on on our roster to be able to provide such deep insights into uh, really the um, nuances and uh, the tricky elements of working on system level projects. And especially like she mentioned, um, as tricky as a health sector and a health system um, project and different solutions to work on. So thank you, Kim, again, uh, we really appreciate your input to today's webinar. Um, so to sum up, just to say that um, 
we've talked about um, a little bit about our organization, um, some of the collaborations that we've done in different parts of Canada to uh, support community health centers or First Nation governments, uh, their health departments, or even wellness organizations, healing lodges and businesses, all of whom are vital parts of the health systems and, and the ecosystem in a community. So, and then Kim took it a step further to actually break down what some of these solutions could actually look like and can help uh, different communities when they lead these projects and the ways that Kesso can partner and support and contribute towards the community's objectives. So I hope that has been helpful. Uh, so as we end our presentation today, um, I would like you to take you back to Pangerton, uh, the beautiful Pangerton, as you can see on the slide, uh, beautiful, serene community who are tight knit um, and rich with their culture and are working tirelessly towards um, healing their community, having identified health and wellness as a major component of their economic development. And even today, uh, they keep working as a community so that they can thrive together. So all to say at the end of the presentation, um, thank you for your time uh, being able to listen to us and um, share in the experience with us through our different journeys and our different projects. And we hope you have a safe um, and a better day <laughs> for the rest of the day today. Um, in case of any questions or concerns or to learn more about our services, etc., here are contact details. And we're also open to any questions from uh, everyone participating today. And with that, I can stop sharing my screen, perhaps, Paul, and then we can get into our next sections. Great, thank you. I'm just sharing now um, the contact information for Elia, for Kim, and for uh, Stacia Keen. Uh, one moment, please. I'll just add that's in the chat function. Thank you, Paul. And if you have any questions at all for Kim or for Elia, um, just type it into the chat. Um, and then I'm sure. Um, they'll be happy to, to answer that question. Please be aware that um, the recording will be shared probably this afternoon at, um, at the uh, CanDo website, edo.ca, links to learning, and just go to the Wednesday webinar um, menu button and it'll be, um, it'll be listed there as well. And then we'll, uh, we'll also provide in that same location, the, uh, the contact information um, for the presenters today from Kesso. So just um, another minute or so for any more questions or comments. Paul, did you have any questions or comments? <laughs> I'm seeing you uh, after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a, you know, it's always insightful to hear from other organizations and um, in terms of what they're doing, because um, you know the, their experience is kind of scaffold onto what what we're doing. We kind of go off on our tangent, and we meet together every once in a while, and then touch base on what's going on. So, um, what what is striking to me is something that um, a number of organizations have um, have spoken about, which is the health in the community is kind of the the cornerstone that if you look at health, um, it then, um, everything is built up on top of that. Um, and it's really critical. And it's nice to, to see that Kesso uh, feels the same way and has experienced the same way in terms of um, the feedback that they've got from communities. 
um, can do believes strongly in that. Uh, not only the physical health, but we also look at the economic health mm -hmm. as kind of a, um, um, a foundational piece uh, for uh, prosperity and um, um, and um, resilience in the community moving forward. So not really a question, but just a comment that uh, it's nice to uh, to see that that's being reflected in, in the work of other organizations. Thank you, Paul, appreciate that. Um, I don't know if Kim wanted to add anything because she has decades of um, experience in this, in this field and um, been working for so long. Kim? Um. Well, no, I just uh, just uh, Paul, just to reiterate what Paul said about the economic health and the um, you know health and well-being, and just it just it's impossible to kind of delink those two. Eh? It's just they're just so um, so um, inextricably linked. And I think with the self determination, with taking on like taking control of the health system, I just think that adds another layer of well-being and determination and autonomy and well-being for communities. I, I just think it's everything's kind of going in the right direction when you do that, when that happens in, in communities. So I think there's nothing but good things to come with that. So okay. So if there's no questions, then um, I'm just going to pitch the fact that uh, we have more Wednesday webinars coming up every Wednesday, of course. And, uh, oh, I think there's a question, hold on. Um, so um, Ritu is asking if there's, uh, if you can talk about some funding opportunities and challenges for system strengthening initiatives where time is a factor. Oh, very good question. And a very um, macro level government funding question, <laughs> which is uh, very interesting. Um, the one thing I will add or respond to is um, regarding the funding. A lot of uh, the funding is right now channeled towards uh, the pandemic and the pandemic response. So um, a lot of them are uh, time sensitive in this and in the sense that um, they are um, being channeled very quickly in order to respond to very urgent community challenges. So um, health or mental wellness um, are also few areas that are being funded, uh, but seem to be very pandemic focused, at least right now. Um, but having said that, um, I am guessing because everything is going in the right direction uh, towards strengthening the health systems, there, in my hope, there could be and will be more funding available for that um, from the different provincial, regional, or government levels. And um, was the other part of the question, Paul? Um, so funding and then, um the challenges for system strengthening when you have a, a time as a factor. Sure, for, for this, I will let Kim uh, take this. She'll explain it beautifully. Yeah. So um, if I can just speak to the last one. So Ilya, if a community wanted, uh, needed um, um, support, it would be, it, is it, it's for like, I'm a volunteer, right? And I, I don't know what the, there's no, is there funding involved for the community? Do they have to pay for the um, CASO advisor? So for our services, there is a minimum fee that we do have, uh, which is a daily rate. And then we work with whoever is the client or partner that we wanna work with on what the costs could look like and then go on from there to uh, maybe build a system that works for both of us. And in some cases, we've also worked very closely with communities themselves to apply for a different funding opportunity. So that's also something we do. Right, right. So, but very different than, um, very cost, very affordable though, compared to hiring a private consultant. We believe so, yes. Um, and that's uh, helpful for a lot of communities who are not able to um, afford expensive services, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So just to speak to the second part of that question, and you, you just mentioned it, um, 
the Kessel advisors could help to build capacity through um, helping to write those grants or you know helping to write grants so that you can get resources in there to help to um, build the capacity within. Um, so in time is always like and I, it's, it's unfortunate I just see a lot of um, people are overworked and just taxed out just maxed out with the, with the number of responsibilities they have so time is certainly a factor and like I say sometimes if you can get um, if you have a project or whatever um, and you if you have an outside person like a, a Kessel consultant I, I do this myself I'm in the process of developing um, this is outside my Kessel work but I have an outside body that's helping us do a develop a portal and a, and a website. And we've met for the past nine months every Wednesday morning. And I can tell you, if it wasn't for that outside person, there is no way in God's green earth we would be where we are. It's just the fact that every Wednesday morning we've eked out that time and committed to it. And so we do have what we had, but we do have a website and a portal. We're just kind of tidying it up. But so it's sometimes having that external accountability can help to do that system strengthening um, on a regular kind of um, methodical basis. So I, I would just encourage, um, that's one way to strengthen the, the system when people are so busy is to kind of just have that, even a minimal time commitment just helps to see the project uh, move along. Um, so that's, that's, that's all I can say. And, and to use Kesso or other volunteers to help to build your capacity when, when your time's stretched and time poor. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like it could be even a strategy that, um, or a refined strategy that helps you maybe perhaps um, tackle the very urgent need that you have. So with our advisors, what they're able to do is help any leadership or staff to kind of break down what can be done urgently, what needs to be done later, so that um, helping them prioritize the work. So that's also an area where even for myself personally, or any other professional is when you uh, break down your um, urgencies and your priorities, you are able to tackle what's more time sensitive and therefore needs to be tackled first. And, and like Kim said, um, having someone who's outside the organization always helps like a sounding board um, and the sense of accountability that you're, you're meeting every week or every other week. And so in always in your head, it um, keeps you alert or maybe better than that, keeps you on that path and uh, you keep moving. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, go back to uh, that person um, and clarify anything that you want to do or see if you're going the path that you should be going or analyze that, um, etc. So uh, I think these are also important, not just in health systems, but any systems, but definitely uh, because health is such a critical sector, especially right now um, in, in a time sensitive mode, uh, for sure, knowing priorities, strategizing and, and having a sounding board are, are very useful. I've seen communities too, where they've uh, one community is they shared an eight. They didn't have the the money or the um, to hire a person, a full time person HR. So they shared one amongst the different communities. So that's a way of kind of working together to be able to kind of secure the expertise or the function needed. You might not be able to afford it full time, but to be able to kind of just take a piece of it to ensure systems are um, as. Um, comprehensive as possible within that you know if some, you get somebody for a day and you have five communities and they get the HR person for a day so I've seen some of that sharing uh, another instance was um, I think I talked to Ilya about this is a community had funding but they didn't have the the capacity to hire the people to, to do the job which is kind of a it was too bad they had a pot of money there but nobody had the time to do the hiring practices so that might be another instance where communities could band together and hire get somebody to kind of go through all those hr processes Sure. Thank you, Kim. Um, okay, so if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank everybody that took time.
to uh, meet with us and join us today. Um, and also especially to Ilya and Kim for sharing their uh, experiences and uh, tremendous knowledge with us. All right, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Have a thank wonderful you. day. You too. Thank you everyone Thanks. for Take participating. Care. Take care, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Appreciate it, thanks. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, Paul. Take care. You too. I'm just you going too. to uh, end the session now. Sure.